All right then. Hello guys, welcome to the webinar. My name is Taylor. I'm a software support technician here at Concordia Technology Solutions. And today we're going to be going over our initial setup of our Church 360 Ledger site, as well as its chart of accounts. So we'll just go ahead. And just get it started. Let's see. So my name is Taylor Brown. I've been here for about mm, about two years so far, and I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, being able to serve my churches. I never thought I'd be able to serve technology and my church, but you know, here it is, and it was just perfect for me. If you guys ever need to contact me directly then this is my contact information. So please feel free, send me an email, give me a call. You know, I'm gonna get paid whether I, I'm twirling in my chair or talking to you, and I'd much rather talk to you folks. So please just don't even hesitate. So all phones and microphones have been muted. So if you have any questions, any questions at all, please feel free to just uh, type that into the question area. And, uh, you know, I'll either answer it at the end of uh, this class or my colleague Rod Kyles will take care of you. He is very knowledgeable in the Ledger software, so I think he'll be a very good resource for you guys. Um, and if you need to contact him, then that's his contact information. Otherwise, we'll just hang out at the end of this webinar and just answer any questions you guys might have. So we'll start with the class agenda, which we're doing right now. And then we'll have just a, a brief overview uh, just of some accounting concepts and logic that the uh, Ledger software does use. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> sorry, I just came out from outside. Let's see. And uh, once we get that overview finished, then I'll have a brief discussion over uh, different account types, different uh, areas in the software, just kind of a brief overview and uh, of a site navigation. Then we'll just have a brief uh, five minute intermission. Then I'll finish it all up. Then we'll have a quiz and then the rest of it can be dedicated to your uh, questions. So we'll start. Uh, kind of dispersed throughout this course is going to be some accounting principles that the uh, Church 360 ledger uses as far as uh, restricted funds, how it how different account types interact with one another, uh, as, as well as, uh, you know, just any other uh, <clears throat> ways that the software works. Sorry. Yeah. And then uh, we'll start by getting started, which will include logging in as well as the site navigation. I'll also show where you can import your Shepherd Staff database. If you're moving from Shepherd Staff to Church 360, then you might want to move over your finance information. So we can definitely do that. I'll show you how to do that. Then we'll just do some basic setup including the administrative settings, which will include things like users and roles, people who can log in, um, setting up different books, different entities, if you have different organizations that you keep books on, and payees, which are your vendors and how you can create them either during, uh, either during a, a initial transaction or you can uh, create them uh, just from the payee window, which I'll show you. All right. Then we'll get into setting up our chart of accounts. We'll go over the different account types, including restricted funds, which is an important aspect of the Church 360 Ledger software. Then we'll enter in our budgets, then we'll show how to unlock and lock fiscal years. Then we'll just have our quiz and then our Q&A session. So, all right, I'll go ahead, take my face off here. 
All right then. So let's go ahead and get started. All right then. So whenever you first purchase the software, you will end up give if you're the initial administrator, you'll end up getting an email similar to this so that you can uh, just start setting up your account. So once you get the uh, the welcome letter, you can click here where it says set up your account now. If that doesn't work, you can also use this URL. It takes you to the exact same place. And you'll be able to enter in your email as well as determine a password. I already have this all saved, but you just determine your password. It will be different from any of your passwords for uh, Church 360 members or Unite if you use those. If not, then this will just be strictly for you. So then once we sign up, it will ask you to uh, confirm your church information. So make sure the church name, the church phone number, address, that all looks good. If there is a problem, you know, if there's just something that just doesn't look quite right, then this is where you can go ahead and uh, change it. So I could just say, That's probably not the zip code, but I'm not going to look it up just yet. After you make sure that address is correct, you can click submit. And then essentially your account is ready to start. You can start with creating your own book, just starting from scratch. You can choose your fiscal year when it starts and then just the name of your book. If you want to just start from scratch, this would be the way to go. If you had previously used the Shepherd Staff Finance, then you would probably want to upload your finance database, which you would go over here to choose file and just choose whatever uh, Shepherd Staff database you need. It's usually something along the lines of staff and it usually ends in MDB. And we just open that. If your database has any dedicated accounts, then there is a very large chance that transactions will not be carried over. This is just due to different logic between the different systems that I'll get into a little bit later. But uh, if you have any dedicated accounts, then they will import, the balances will import, just not the transactions themselves. So it will just be starting off with that initial balance. Once you submit that, then it will start uploading. It can take anywhere between mm, maybe a half hour to an hour and a half. Or if you choose the wrong uh, database, then it'll say it has no books. But uh, you know, it takes between a half hour to an hour and a half maybe to completely upload. It'll ask you if you need to attach any uh, accounts from your Shepherd Staff database, and then it will uh, slowly upload to your site. So once you have this all uploaded, then you'll automatically see this. Didn't want you guys to wait to see uh, the whole upload process, so I have it right here. So you'll end up seeing something like this. If you see up here, you'll see that there is a subdomain. And right now it's Christ Com Church. And then there's the dot 360 ledger. Whatever comes before the dot 360 ledger is going to be your subdomain. It's important for you to remember so that whenever you go to a different device, you can put in your subdomain dot 360 ledger.com and you'll be able to access it from any device with an internet connection. Okay. Briefly, I wanted to show you that when you're in the process of logging in, that if you forget your password, we do have a forget your password utility. It will send you a password reset email, just like a lot of different sites. And if you didn't receive unlock instructions as a, the initial administrator, then you can just let us know and we'll take care of you for that. Uh, due to the sensitive nature of, you know, your financial information, you, uh, we do have, in effect, a timeout feature in Church 360 Ledger where it will log you out 
once it detects that there's been two hours of inactivity. So it will log you out, you'll just have to log back in, but it is just for your safety. So then once we go ahead and sign back in, this is going to be your main homepage. And so we'll just go over a little bit of the navigation. All the way to the left, there is this orange button with the dollar sign on it. That is your home button. If you're ever anywhere that you just don't recognize and you need to just get back to step one, you just click here and it will take you straight here to where all of your accounts are visible. And then you can just work from there. <clears throat> Next to it is the book selector. Right now we have general income as my main book. However, it is a drop down menu. If you have multiple books, you can click on it and choose between different books. They are going to be completely separate uh, groups of accounts. So in the event you did have to move some income between maybe the church to the school or maybe to a cemetery fund, then uh, you would need to just uh, treat it as if it was a gift or a loan and that you were just giving it to a separate vendor, which I'll go into more detail when we go over in books. Then over here to the right, first we have the print queue. So right here, it looks like a little printer. If we click on that, this is the print queue for any checks that need to be printed. If you write out your checks, then you can just disregard this feature. If you, uh, if you print out your checks, then maybe this will be just a little bit easier for you. And um, <clears throat> uh, most uses for the print queue, it's going to end up being uh, explained in our subsequent webinars. Uh, in the next few days. So once we go in over transactions, you'll be able to go into the print queue and you'll be able to print off your checks. Next to the check, uh, check queue, you have pending transactions. So in the event that you had a Church360 members site, in addition to your ledger site, uh, you're able to put in offerings and attribute them to different members. And since they are connected via your subdomain, anything that is entered in as an offering in members, it can become, it can come over here to where you can just immediately enter it in as a deposit. You don't have to, you can either deposit it or you can click the X button to get rid of it forever. Either way, it's just, uh, just an extra little feature for you. Next, we have this little book icon. This is for your reports. It's gonna be gone into a little more detail, I believe in the third webinar for Ledger. We'll be going over general Ledger, your statement of income and expense, We'll go over uh, the report of your chartered accounts, your balance sheet, and your event log, which shows just, you know, whatever has happened onto your site. Next, we have our settings gear. And I'll go into a little more detail between all of these, but uh, a main takeaway would be to remember that the top area of the settings icon would be dedicated to just this book. So anything as far as chart of accounts, budgets, fiscal years, transactions, that's all going to affect your general income account in this case. So it won't affect anything for uh, Christ Community School, just for, just for the current book that you're on, that will be what these are dedicated for. On the lower end for general through payees, this happens, this is uh, dedicated strictly to your entire site. So any additional, any additions that you put in these settings are going to uh, be attributed to all of your books. So just the entire general site. 
and I'll come back to those in just a second, but I also wanted to uh, make note of the user settings as well. You can have your own little avatar here if you need to, or you can just click user settings, and this is where you can change your password or even change your email if you need to. So after that little rundown, right below it, there is this little white bar, and we have a nifty little name for it. We call it the Omni Bar because we have to be special and we like having weird names. Uh, but this is basically going to be your quick access row. So if you needed a specific specific account you could just click in here you have all of the accounts that you can go over it just takes you straight there you can also go ahead and type in whatever account that you want to see and you can just go straight there in addition to that not only are you able to go into any of the accounts really quickly but you can also go straight to a transaction so if you needed to just uh, dive in here, quickly make a quick payment, and then be on your way, you could just go to new transaction, go to payment, fill that out, and then boom, you're gonna be done. Right here, you'll notice that there is some, that there are some breadcrumbs that show exactly where this account lies. So you'll see that uh, health insurance is involuntary, payroll, liabilities, and it will go all the way back to home if you so desire. So this just kind of shows you where it is, especially in chart of accounts. And so you can always go back to either just the category or another, uh, another area if you so need. Most, if not all, I can't think of a view off the top of my head that doesn't have this feature, but you, but most views you can export to excel if you just prefer to uh, operate on a spreadsheet or if you need to, that for a report then please feel free to do that and you will also be able to print directly from the browser if you need to then finally there is this drop down menu it says 2020 right here you can choose whatever date range you want to show. So if you're in a particular account like health insurance and you wanted to see a particular, uh, particular fiscal year, a particular quarter, or even a particular month, then you could very well just choose that. You just choose whatever it is that you need and that would be it. You can also uh, just manually type in or choose a date range so then whatever report you're looking for you can definitely choose exactly what time period you want to show for that so once we have a small little area, a small idea of our navigation i'm going to go back to our settings and after you verify that all of your church all of your church information is correct but then you notice oh no i forgot I forgot a PO box or something, no worries. You just go back up here to general and it's gonna have all of your information. You can choose, you can uh, update your church name and in here it's kind of, it's uh, right here you have your customer number with CTS. So if you have any uh, support questions, then you can always add this customer number. It'll always make it easier for us to look you up. And, uh, so that information is always available and we do have checks that we support uh, generally we support checks that are from printrevolution.co so co it was previously forms plus that is what we had uh, generally set it up to uh, to take however it doesn't have to be purchased from print revolution but it does have to match that particular format. Our checks are three part checks. However, we don't offer three checks per sheet. So we only have two styles available. We have top checks and we have middle checks. So top checks would be the check and the top followed by two stubs as well as middle checks where there's a stub 
on either, uh, either end on top or bottom of the check. So if you by any chance had middle checks that you were using from Shepherd staff, you would be able to use them in Church 360 Ledger. Once you choose that, you can choose whether or not you want to have a check signature. And once you save that, that information, when you go back to the print queue, you'll be able to print directly from the browser onto uh, purchased cards or part, purchased check stock if you so need. On to more administrative duties. We have users and then we have roles. Users are going to be who can log in onto your site. So if we go here, you'll have a whole list of anybody who can log into your site. You can just simply add one by clicking this button here and you enter in their email and you get to determine what role they have. Roles in Church 360 generally mean what permissions they have. What can they see? What can they edit? So if you needed to add an email here and you wanted to add another administrator, which we do recommend, you know, just in case one administrator is not available, then you can always uh, just choose here and then submit. Once you go ahead and submit, it will automatically send an invitation to that email for them to set up a login. If you ever needed to edit a user, you can always go back to this user's view. You can click on the user you want to edit and you can add or subtract different roles if you want to. If they say, hey, we didn't get an invitation, you know, I don't have anything to set up. You can go ahead here and click resend invitation and then uh, that email will be sent back to their email so they can uh, create their login. So roles are basically for permissions. It basically tells you what this person can see and what this person can do. So as an administrator, you're going to have free reign. So you're going to want to have maybe one or two people as an administrator. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, you can add roles as you need it. Let's say if you wanted to add uh, a financial secretary and you wanted to uh, apply this role to a specific book, or you can uh, apply it to all of them. Uh, really, it just depends on you. Say you want your financial secretary to only have access to the school book. So then anything in the general income account, they wouldn't be able to see. There are, th there are uh, <clears throat> two different permissions. There's management and transactions. As far as management, you can determine what they can manage, what they can change. So if you want them to manage or change chart of accounts, like create accounts or delete accounts, managing reoccurring transactions, or if you want them just to view uh, a, a certain account or all accounts, you could choose all accounts, or if you only want them to see specific accounts, you can in fact uh, uh, differentiate and specify what exactly you want them to see. For transactions, you can also choose what type of transaction they can actually do or actually create. So if you wanted them to only be able to create deposits, but you didn't want them to make payments or write checks, then you do have the option here. If you just had a, a secretary that needs to just come in, print the check real quick, and then move on, then you can have that. And so once you just choose your particular uh, your particular role, then you can click submit. And then whenever you create a new user, you have the option to add this role to them if you don't want them to have full administrator privileges. Next up in settings, there are books. Now these are separate entities, so they will have their own assets, they'll have their own liabilities, their own accounts in general. They will be considered separate. 
So these accounts are used to track funding given to just a specific organization. So it could be uh, a, between the church, a school, a daycare, a thrift shop, uh, even a cemetery. If that those books are going to be completely separate from the general income of your church, then you can create a book separately. If you ever needed to edit the book name, you would go over here and just click over here. Once you have it selected and it's open, you can make whatever changes it is that you need, as well as whatever the starting date is. This is just to show exactly how much activity you are able to enter in to this book. If it's just a, if it's a new book, naturally you want it to only start uh, when it was created. So once we submit that, that's all saved. It will let you know that it's been updated and you should be good to go. For users, roles, and books, you may have noticed that all the way when you select an account, a user, a role, whatever, you may notice that there is this little minus button. If you ever needed to delete anything and you see this little minus button, this is just what you would click and then this would be what you delete. So if you needed to delete a login, delete a role that you no longer use, or a book that you no longer want, then you can do so here. And we're almost done with our first half of our settings. We're going to finish off with payees. And this is essentially all of your vendors. With your vendors or payees, if you needed to find one or edit one, you can use this search bar to find one, find it. If you needed just a particular vendor, then you just have it pulled up right here. If you needed to edit any of its initial information, like its first last name, or uh, its address of any sort. If you needed to add any notes to this particular vendor or payee, then you have the option to do that. And once you click submit, it will be saved. You can also view the entire history of this payee. It will, this will be gone into more detail in the reports training, but you can drill down to all of its, uh, all the details should you need to. And just like users, roles, books, uh, they are able to be deleted as well if you need. <laughs> Payees can be created on the fly when you create a transaction, you know, like your first transaction for this payee, you can create it from the transaction menu, which will be gone into more detail with the transactions. But the best practice would be, I would generally recommend you add it from here onto the payee window, just to make sure that you have any and all information that you need to add to it. Now, in order to set up a chart of accounts, it's important to know exactly what accounts we are dealing with. So on our account types, <coughs> we have uh, five really to choose from. The first one would be the, would be the assets. Uh, anything that you would own uh, or anything that you have uh, monetary or uh, non-monetary fixed assets, anything that you have, this would be considered an asset. So we do have uh, current or monetary and we also have fixed or non-monetary. Examples for current might be any money that you have in your checking or savings account, any CDs, and any stocks. So anything that has money attached to it, then that's going to be your monetary area. For fixed or non-monetary assets, we want to include things like buildings, land, any sort of equipment that we might have. And so we just have all of these assets all in one area. A big part of Church 360 Ledger is its 
restricted funds. And this is money reserved for a very specific purpose. And this could be anything between uh, a summer mission trip, a memorial, a hymenal purchase fund, any sort of fund that is that the money is restricted only for this purpose. Now, restricted funds act nearly the same as asset accounts. So it's just kind of one area of the pie that is an asset account. So we have uh, restricted funds and non-restricted funds in the asset account itself. So this is just a part of the asset account and thus it doesn't need to be budgeted and its balances will carry over to the next year. Its balances will be held in the asset account overall, but it will still be uh, considered uh, restricted and so we wouldn't be able to use it for any other purpose. Another important account would be liabilities. And this is just basically anything that we owe, any long-term or short-term debts for your congregation. So some short-term debt, that might be anything between payroll taxes, insurance premiums, any HSAs, or even offerings for other congregations. If they're just you know, reserved just for those congregations, then it's something that you owe to them. For long-term debt, anything that's going to take uh, years for you to pay off, things like mortgages, loans, uh, any sort of uh, car or bank loan, then this would be included in your liabilities. Now, if you're coming from Shepherd staff, then you might recognize that dedicated accounts from Shepherd staff act like liabilities whereas these restricted accounts in this software act like assets. So there is a bit of a learning curve between using them um, for the same restricted funds. So if you were just uh, really attached to using the dedicated accounts option, then you can have a workaround where you use liabilities instead of restricted accounts, but it does have its pros and its cons. So restricted accounts, this is what the, the ledger software was built on. It is what it was meant to use. So with using liabilities instead of a restricted account, you wouldn't be able to make deposits to the account. Instead, you would need to uh, deposit it into a, an asset or an income account and then move it over using a journal entry. And you also wouldn't be able to use the pending transactions from Church 360 members. This is due to the fact that when you import it for the deposit to go through, you need to choose whatever restricted account or asset account that you need to attribute it to. So, you know, you wouldn't be able to bring it directly to that liability account. There are some pros to using liabilities instead of the restricted accounts, even though it's generally not recommended. If you wanted to show your restricted money as a liability on your balance sheet, then this would be a way for you to go. You could also forego using a income and expense account to show the flow of money in and out of the restricted funds. It would just be uh, completely in the liability account and everything will be shown there. <clears throat> so, mentioning income accounts, these are the accounts that you use to record your revenue, uh, during the current fiscal year. It is budgeted, so you will need to, uh, you, you can create a, a budget if you so need. And uh, any income can be recorded and recognized whenever you actually get those funds. So once you get all of that, <clears throat> such as uh, anything like offerings, 
interest on bank accounts, rental property, uh, any of these examples, this would be recorded in an income account. And it's also important to remember that unlike restricted funds, income accounts zero out at the end of the year. Once that fiscal year is complete and that new fiscal year is opened up, that income goes down to zero. So then it can just start off with a clean slate. Similarly, we also have expense. So expense accounts show how you are spending this money that you have. And they're often used as offset accounts for things like checks. Here you can also apply budgets. And different examples can include anything between uh, your salaries for your staff, materials, office supplies, any sort of uh, expense that you need for your church to keep running, then this would be an expense. And just like income accounts, they are going to zero out at the end of the year. Once that new fiscal year is started, then it's gonna start off fresh. So after that, if it's all right with you, I'm going to go get a drink of water and then we will just uh, come back from about five minutes of intermission and we will finish up how to create your chart of accounts. So I'll talk to you then.
All right, guys. Thank you for your patience with me. I'll just go ahead and get back in here and we can start on our chart of accounts. So in order to get to your chart of accounts, you're gonna go over here to the settings uh, gear icon. And we're just gonna go straight up here to the top to chart of accounts. So here you can see it's already kind of started up, but in the event that you need to add any uh, different accounts, you just go ahead and go to your specific type that you need to add. And over here, you'll see that you can add a new account as well as a new category. So categories are essentially just used to group similar accounts and similar uh, subcategories. So if you ever needed to uh, just organize your chart of accounts, this would be the best way to do it in my opinion. So say I have a new account called Petty Cash and I needed to add an account number. Really, this is just whatever it is, whatever is easiest for you to uh, just find your account number should you need it. It does not have to be the uh, account number for your bank and just uh, just anything to make things just a little easier for you. So, so any sort of uh, uh, balance number and you can also choose from this account if you want to write checks from this. So if you do check this, you will be able to uh, uh, write checks. If you have a check open, you will have the option to uh, to add this as the account that you write from. The initial balance is the balance at the time you begin Ledger. So it is important to get this uh, correct as it is the amount that everything from, the, from then on, it builds from this amount. So any sort of transaction, it will reflect off of the initial balance. In the event that you need to change your initial balance, you can very well come here and make those changes just by clicking on any of these. Right now, I'll just add zero for right now. If you needed to edit that, say, hey, I already had an initial balance, you just go ahead up here, you click here, and then you can add this beginning balance again. It is recommended that you not add or edit your beginning balances after you've reconciled for the first time. So up until you uh, reconcile, you can go ahead and change the initial balance however you need, because then it will just recalculate in the software. Once you reconcile, however, then that might kind of put things in stone. So if you need to edit that, then you can always use journal entries or payments to add on to that beginning balance. So I did mention categories. Say if I wanted our petty cash to be in a specific category, I could choose new. And I could just choose this to be just miscellaneous. If I wanted a, a category where I just have any sort of miscellaneous uh, expenses or assets, then I have that option. So once you have a category over here. If it's to the far left, then it is on its own. So right here, petty cash is by itself and the miscellaneous category is by itself. I also have the option to add a category, something like cash, that I can even add, that I can nest in the miscellaneous category. So miscellaneous could be my category just for any sort of miscellaneous assets or anything that I have lying around. And if I wanted to specify uh, cash, then you could drag it over here. If you take the cash category and you drag it over to the right, then you'll notice that that arrow moves. So when that arrow moves, it means whatever is above it right now, that's going to be its main category. So this is us net nesting the cash subcategory into the miscellaneous category. And then from here, we can nest the petty cash account into the cash subcategory. 
So you can go ahead and nest categories within categories, and you can nest um, accounts into different categories as well. You cannot nest an account within an account. So this is why uh, different categories might be useful in, uh, in just organizing your chart of accounts. So after we add that, we have uh, categories, we have subcategories. Now we're able to uh, write checks from it. Now that I've checked that I can write checks from it, whenever I get my initial amount, I can add that beginning balance whenever I need to up until I reconcile for the first time. And, uh, and that will be it. <clears throat> So for any asset accounts, you won't see it for income or expense accounts, but for asset accounts, you'll have the option to create a restricted fund. So restricted and non-restrictive, they're all going to be the uh, two pieces of the petty cash pie. But if I wanted another restricted fund, I could click here and choose the name and the account number. So say I just want petty cash for pizza, who knows? And if I wanted an account number, I could put that in. If not, I can leave it blank and then just go ahead and submit it. So then this will act as my restricted account and anything that I have left will be considered non-restricted. So if I had the $100 in petty cash, and pizza is only going to be uh, 50, then the other 50 will be in the unrestricted for this asset account. Now, after we have added in all of our accounts, we might also wanna clean things up. We might want to deactivate or delete them. And with that, you can uh, certainly go over here to any sort of account, you can click on it and instead of changing the beginning balance or changing whether or not you can write checks to it, you can delete it. For accounts that have transactions in them, those will be uh, deactivated. So uh, you'll still have that historical record for deleting accounts and categories, then they won't show up for the next calendar year. So if you uh, delete it uh, today, then you might actually see it on some reports up until January uh, of 2022. But you know it will still only be uh, <clears throat> it will still uh, it will still be there. It will also not allow you to delete an account with an actual balance. So you will want to make sure that you zero it out first. So after that, you'll be able to uh, delete accounts and categories, however it is that you see fit. After you have made changes to your accounts, this is not all set in stone just yet. Right now, you've just made those changes, and if everything here looks good as you want it, then you'll need to save those changes. So anything that you've done on this page so far, it has not been saved yet. So you will need to go ahead and click Save Changes in order for those changes do, to be uh, applied. And if you wanted to start just from scratch, then go ahead and click Reset, and it will just go back to uh, however it is that you, uh, you had it before. Mm -hmm. All right, so after we actually create our accounts, now we might be interested in adding in budgets. So adding in budgets for your income and expense accounts, you would go up here to the gear icon, go down here to budgets. And if you have not actually saved your information, it will tell you that something has been created and it will ask you if you want to discard those changes and confirm, we'll want to confirm. And then we'll be able to navigate away from that, that page. So here is our budget view. 
we have the option to uh, uh, just look at any different fiscal year should you need to. I think this thing needs to be woken up. Okay. So from the budget view, you can choose the fiscal year that you want to make your budget for. So you can make it as in, in advance as, as you need. So if you uh, just select the fiscal year, it will turn here and you'll be able to just start entering it in. If you were looking to just use old, uh, old budget amounts or, or old actual amounts from the previous fiscal year, you do have this option over here to this drop down menu to automatically apply last year's budget or last year's actual, and then it will apply it across the board where you can then edit it if you need to. If you wanna enter it in manually, you can definitely do that. If you go over here, you have a total and then you have one for each month. So if I wanted everything to be split up equally between the 12 months, say I have 1,200 right here, if I'm hoping that I have 1,200 from investment income this year, then I can go ahead and put that in here. It will separate it uh, for each month equally. So each month will get 100. So then all I have to do is just navigate away from here and that will show. You can also go ahead and enter in um, month by month if you so need as well. And you'll notice that some of these rows are grayed out and some are not. So the grayed out rows are categories. This essentially just gives you a running total. So whatever it is that you have here, this will all be added up. So once all of these are added up, uh, then you will see the changes in the categories. So you won't be able to budget a category per se. So if you have any trouble, make sure that it's not grayed out. You will need to edit the accounts within the category in order to change this amount. Another interesting thing here is you are able to export to Excel. So in the event that you, know, you had a, a shoddy internet connection or if you wanted to work on a different computer, then you could export all of these budgets to an Excel document. And this will automatically have those algorithms entered in. So if I entered in something for an account, then it will start add, it will add up using the categories based on whatever the account is. I can also enter in different amounts and then if everything here looks good and then I want to apply it to uh, my Church 360 ledger site, you can also copy and paste. So if you go over here to your accounts, you can just highlight your accounts because that's you know really what we're going to be inputting. If we copy this, and then go back, you'll wanna to go to the top left-hand corner and then you'll be able to paste. So then these will all be entered in as, a, as the accounts were reflected in your Excel. So after you have added in all of your budgets, once everything looks good, just like your chart of accounts, you're going to want to make sure that you make sure to press the save button at the very end. So anything that you put in right now, it will uh, not save until you actually press save changes and you get this little green ribbon up here saying that everything has been updated. If you needed to reset and just start from scratch, you could click the reset button. Last but not least, we have fiscal years. The reoccurring and imported transactions, that'll be covered in tr the transaction webinar. I believe it's tomorrow. So right now we're just going to finish up with our fiscal years. And this will give you 
a list of any fiscal years that have information in it. Since I did import from Shepherd Staff, I have it all the way from 2012, and everything looks good so far. <clears throat> Here is also where you would see where your current fiscal year is. So whatever you're currently on, then that's what uh, what amount you are actually uh, editing at the moment. So it will tell you exactly what <clears throat> what fiscal year you're on. Below here, you can change the starting month of the next fiscal year. So say if you needed to go from a calendar fiscal year to a non-calendar fiscal year, if I wanted to start it in, uh, say, July, in just a, a couple of days, then I could choose here and choose the next fiscal year to start in July. So then I will have a partial fiscal year from January to June of uh, 2021. And then we'll also start a new fiscal year starting in July and ending uh, at the end of June next year. So if you do have a, a partial here, no worries. Most likely it's just because the fiscal year changed. Now here with these fiscal years, you'll see these lock buttons. Now it's a little confusing, but these symbols represent what you want to do. So right now it looks like 2016 is unlocked and 2015 is locked. So if you wanted to click the green button, that means that you want to unlock it. So it is already a locked year. You want to unlock it so that then <laughs> you'll get this red icon, meaning that it's not locked, but if you click here, it will relock it for you. And you can also see that locking a fiscal year will also automatically lock anything, any fiscal year before it. So this is just to keep uh, Uh, just to keep your totals uh, the same so that fiscal years from uh, year to year, they remain consistent. So that would be my main presentation. So if it's all right with you, <coughs> I just have a few quiz questions. There's absolutely, uh, you know, no grading. I'm not going to call, I'm not going to, uh, reach out to you and tell you all the ways that you were wrong. Uh, I'm just wanting to make sure that, uh, you know, some aspects of uh, our presentation uh, made sense to you. So for this quiz, if you could, let me know, first off, What type of account is used to create a bank account? So this is any account that you would use to write checks from, either a saving or a checking account. Would that be an asset, a restricted fund, or would it be income? Just wait a few more seconds. And it looks like everybody was correct as it is an asset account. So any account that you use for your bank accounts, it's going to be an asset because it's the money that you have. The next poll. If by chance your church has to take out a loan, what account would you create for it? Okay, looks like almost everybody voted. Then I'm going to say you guys are correct. It is a liability account. So just anything that needs to be paid, anything that you owe, 
then that would be a liability account. So that when you enter in a transaction to pay the payment of the loan, you would use this liability as the offset account. All right, there are also <clears throat> only two accounts that can have budgets assigned to them. By any chance, would you know which ones they could be? You guys are fast. And everybody who votes are superstars. I am not because I didn't go to the right slide. But the answer is C and D, income and expense accounts. They are the only two accounts that have budgets. So if you ever needed to uh, compare or contrast, then you would take a look at the in statement of income and expense and that would show you how your budgets are going. And last but not least, a restricted fund will carry over its balance when advancing your fiscal year. Is this true or is it false? Y'all are on that buzzer. I'm going to take you guys to my game show. Because you are also all right. It is all true. It will carry over its balance, unlike income and expense accounts. So after that, do any of you have any questions? If you uh, have more of a, a specific question for your church that you don't want to, uh, that you don't need to share, uh, please feel free to you know, either call our number or uh, email us at support. We're always happy to help. Um, and uh, <clears throat> just hope everybody has a wonderful day and I'll be happy to help. Let's see. All right, I'm not seeing any questions or any chats. So I'll go ahead and wrap this up. Oh, I think we have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you copy journal entries to create similar ones? That's a good question. And not one I know off the top of my head, but I know how to get it. So let's just create a journal entry. And let's see, I can make it reoccurring. If I go to doo -doo -doo, specific account, there's checks. Of course, I don't have one right off the bat. So if I make one, please ignore. No, helps if I know that. <laughs> and then let's see, liabilities. Sorry about that. And I make that journal entry. Then would I be able to? Hmm. I'm not entirely sure. I might have to ask Rod on that. 
So sorry, I don't have an answer for you directly, Paul, but I am going to get it back to you. Uh, deleting a transaction account, et cetera, will it archive or actually remove it? Uh, very good question, Mary Jo. It will remove it. It will uh, uh, take it off of the site and it will recalculate accordingly. So if you need to uh, have an audit trail, I would recommend uh, voiding a transaction if you need to or uh, just deactivating an account. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, Paula and Mary Jo, I'll give you some uh, <clears throat> some extra material to answer your questions. Hopefully it'll be more informative than my uh, small answer right now, but uh, if there are no other questions, then I'll go ahead and uh, just kind of wrap this up. If you guys need me again, you know my contact information. Otherwise, I just hope you have a lovely day. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye.